Okay, so the first document is a supplement to motion for sanctions. Based on discovery received during and after the hearing on this motion, Barry Morphew supplements his motion for discovery sanctions and for punitive contempt sanctions as follows. Part 1. Introduction. Number 1. During the January 2022 hearings on this matter, the defense received over 23,000 pages of discovery, much of it highly exculpatory. Most of this late provided discovery should have been disclosed eight months ago, well before the preliminary hearing and the multiple discovery sanctions hearings in this case. Indeed, the court long ago ordered disclosure of this material. Number two, following issuance of a defense subpoena ducis tecum, this court conducted an in-camera review of Joseph K. Hill's internal affairs file. Following that review, disclosures were made to the defense. The defense received the flash drive containing the SDT disclosures on Monday, February 7th, 2022, and were able to open the drive on February 8th. As a result of this disclosure, it is revealed that much more exculpatory evidence had not been produced to the defense prior to the preliminary hearing that would have changed the outcome of the hearing. The SDT, the SDT's disclosure also reveals that much more exculpatory evidence has still not been produced to date. Additionally, Mr. Morphew's attorneys received an operable electronic storage device and first had access to the material on February 2nd, 2022. Highly exculpatory information was contained in that device as well. Part two, additional exculpatory material covered by new disclosures. Cahill, arresting Mr. Morphew now is the worst decision that you can make. Number three, Mr. Cahill and CBI agent Graham were the co-lead investigators of the year-long Morphew investigation. On December 2nd, 2021, Mr. Cahill was interviewed by Internal Affairs. In that interview, Cahill stated he told many law enforcement witnesses in this case that arresting Mr. Morphew was premature and the worst decision that could be made. He also stated the case was not remotely ready for anybody to move the case forward. Number four. In the interview, Mr. Cahill also stated that he shared these opinions and reasons for his opinions with Agent Graham. Mr. Cahill suggests in the interview that Agent Graham agreed with his view. Agent Cahill's two supervisors, CBI De Deputy Director Chris Schaefer and CBI Agent Kemper, talked with Chafee County Sheriff John Speezy about the concerns expressed by Agents Cahill and Graham. Mr. Cahill stated that Sheriff Speezy did not heed CBI's advice or opinions and moved forward with Mr. Morphew's arrest. Mr. Cahill summed up by saying it is what it is. Number five, the affidavit in support of the arrest of Mr. Morphew, which was attested to by District Attorney Linda Stanley, then Chief Deputy District Attorney Jeff Lindsay and Investigator Alex Walker, states that agents Cahill and Graham reviewed the entire affidavit and implies that they supported the arrest of Mr. Morphew. Aside from Mr. Cahill's misrepresentations about how little of the affidavit he reviewed, Mr. Cahill's statements made during this, I inter this IA interview that he did not believe the arrest should have been made also directly contradict the affirmations made by the district attorney's office in the affidavit to arrest Mr. Morphew. Number six. In discovery thus far, the prosecution has not provided a single email, document, text, or report documenting that Mr. Cahill and or Agent Graham and other CBI supervisors communicated this exculpatory information to other law enforcement witnesses and individuals at the DA's office, which includes CBI's opinion that Mr. Morphew's arrest was premature and was the worst decision that could be made nor has there any discovery produced by a single member of the prosecution team disclosing the basis and underlying reasons for CBI's opinion that more investigation and evidence was needed to be obtained before, if ever, arresting Barry Morphew. Number seven, due to the lack of production of this information prior to critical hearings, the defense was unable to reveal or present in court the fact that the arrest warrant affidavit contained falsehoods and misrepresentations. 
the defense was unable to investigate and present this highly exculpatory information in the preliminary hearing and in the multiple hearings on the motion for sanctions. Uh, so part three, in this section, the defense is citing multiple cases. And for the average person, case law can be a dangerous sort of rabbit hole, but they get into this stuff in the next section. So I'm just gonna skip to that. Part four, the cumulative impact of the rampant continuing discovery violations warrant the most severe sanction. Number 15, at the hearing on this motion, Mr. Morphew requested a meaningful remedy from this court. After reviewing the newly provided information, Mr. Morphew is convinced more than ever that the only just remedy is dismissal of this case in its entirety. Had the withheld information been available at the preliminary hearing, it is certain that probable cause would not have been found. Number 16. Thus, either as a function of this court's authority to dismiss the case as a discovery sanction for outrageous governmental conduct, or through the vehicle of reconsidering the ruling at the preliminary hearing, this court should dismiss this case. Number 17. The facts of this case, as this court has seen through the submissions, exhibits, and evidence, warrants warrant the most severe sanction. There is no way to remedy the damage that the governmental misconduct has caused. The preliminary hearing indisputably violated Mr. Morphew's due process rights and would not have resulted in a finding of probable cause had the evidence not been withheld. The intentionality and pattern that have been demonstrated cry out for a powerful and severe sanction to deter the outrageous government conduct witnessed here. Number 18. This court should find powerful guidance in the Court of Appeals words in People v. Ald when the court stated, we conclude that when the integrity of the court is compromised as here by overzealous prosecution, dismissal of the case is an appropriate remedy. In this case, the integrity of the court has been compromised by repeated presentation of false and misleading evidence at the preliminary hearing, and even at the hearing on the motions for sanctions slash dismissal. The only appropriate remedy is vacation of the fraudulently obtained result at the preliminary hearing, dismissal. Number 19, the circumstances in this case are like those that compelled dismissal in People v. Alberico, there, the prosecution failed to share victim interviews that were materially inconsistent with the victim's testimony at trial until after the prosecution's case in chief. Here, the, prosecution's fa the prosecution failed to share critical exculpatory information until after the prosecution witnesses testified at the preliminary hearings, and then continued that intentional pattern of non-disclosure, repeatedly waiting until just after critical hearings and stages before turning, before turning over impeachment material that would have been highly exculpatory had it been received before, not after the witness testified. Number 20, based on the evidence and submissions before this court, there can be no doubt that at the very least, the prosecutor has been involved in this misconduct from early on in the investigation. Mr. Morphew's attorneys have been left to scavenge for hints of undisclosed Brady material even after the prosecution has repeatedly represented that such material had been disclosed. Number 21. Under the circumstances of this case, no remedy short of dismissal is appropriate. The promise of Brady v. Maryland that the due process clause will protect a defendant from a prosecutor who withholds exculpatory information ring hollow when a prosecutor disregards her obligations in the hopes that no one will find out. If the deterrent sanction of dismissal is not appropriate in this case, when would it be? Number 22, it is abundantly clear that had the prosecution not intentionally withheld massive amounts of exculpatory evidence prior to the preliminary hearing, probable cause would not have been found. The only just remedy is dismissal of the case. This can be accomplished as a discovery sanction, a sanction for outrageous governmental misconduct, or as a reconsideration of the result of the preliminary hearing. 
Then there are three exhibits. Uh, exhibit A uh, is titled Cahill Exculpatory Statements and Timeline of Events. And in this two-page document, it's, it, it's a timeline of it's a timeline of events, but then in the second column, it's, uh, it's labeled follow-up questions at preliminary hearing if discovery was not withheld, concealed, or destroyed. So, so basically it, it shows what happened and it shows what the defense said would have happened had all of that information not been uh, what they alleged to be purposely undisclosed. Um, so I won't read through that whole document, but it's, it's a good one to look at and consider. Uh, Exhibit B is the Internal Affairs Investigation Report, and uh, I'll just go through that. So this, this is their report uh, regarding Agent Cahill. Uh, Agent Cahill explained the sources of his stress. Army Reserve deployment schedule. He was set to travel to the Philippines in January of 2021, but that fell through. Then he was set for and attended military school from March through May of 2021. Title, The Morphew Investigation, Arrest Made of Subse Suspect. Point one, Agent Cahill thought the arrest of the suspect in this investigation was premature. He said he spent a year of his life putting the case together. He said this came about while he was attending his military school, March through May, 2021. He saw, quote, an erosion of framework that myself and Derek Graham put together, end quote. Graham is a CBI agent working along with Cahill on the Morphew investigation. Point two, Agent Cahill said there was nothing he could do about the arrest and a lack of continuity happening right when he was about to graduate from his military school. He described the arrest of the suspect as the worst decision that could have been made. He felt that he owed it to the investigation to ensure the best case possible was put together, and this was now not happening with a hasty arrest. Titled District Attorney Complaint of Agent Cahill. Point. District attorneys on the Morphew case complained to CBI administration about Agent Cahill's testimony from an August 2021 hearing. Agent Cahill said before his testimony, he received a phone call from the defense attorney on the night of August 23rd, wanting him to appear at the preliminary hearing. Cahill said he showed up to the hearing unprepared and had almost no communication with the sheriff's office or the district attorney's office before the hearing. Agent Cahill said the district attorney's complaint specifically asked that he no longer works on the case. Wow. Uh, now I feel bad for uh, saying, making, I, I made, I made snarky remarks that day about him, you know, not being able to show up to the case. And um, I guess this explains it. Now I kind of feel like a jerk. I mean, but that happens as, as information continues to come out in any case. Anyway, title, Agent Cahill transferred to CBI's marijuana unit. The week after district attorney complaint to CBI, Agent Cahill says he was notified about his transfer, transfer to the CBI's marijuana unit from his major crimes position. He said he knows the transfer, the transfer was not retaliatory, but he feels disappointed with his work product and that he disappointed the district attorney, the sheriff's office, and CBI. I mean, it sounds like a demotion. I think that's meant to sound like a demotion. But, you know, this is internal affairs writing it and not defense attorneys. Okay, uh, title, Letter of Intent to Sue. Point, Agent Cahill learned that he was subject of an intent to sue by the defense attorney on the Morphew case, by the defendant's attorney on the Morphew case. He has never been sued before, so this added to his stress. Title, Zoom call Agent Cahill had with the defense. Point, Agent Cahill took part in a virtual call with the Morphew defense. He said this caused persons in his chain of command to be unhappy about his performance in this meeting slash call. I asked Agent Cahill if he has been offered outlets to talk with professionals, counseling, etc., as this stress was taking a toll on him. Cahill said he was ordered by Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Director Chris Schaefer 
to see Dr. Nicoletti. Cahill said he would be accepting of that, but his tone and demeanor in the interview indicated otherwise. I did follow up with Cahill on this same topic later in the interview, where he assured me he was committed, committed to speaking with counselors. Agent Cahill told me he did not realize, quote, how distracted I was until the 19th, end quote. Cahill said the morning he shot his hand, he had worked out and felt good. He had a motorcycle ride planned with a friend. Cahill said he rarely takes time off for himself and has not taken annual leave since 2019. Cahill said he was also looking forward to the following week as his father was coming to Colorado Springs for Thanksgiving. That's interesting. We knew that there was an accidental discharge of a firearm in his residence, uh, but apparently he shot himself in the hand. Oh, I, it was so hard not to put a bad joke in there. Okay. Agent Cahill talked more about this transfer to the marijuana unit. Cahill said he spoke to various persons and that he needed to find the positives in this new assignment. Cahill said he recently began to learn about the distillation process related to marijuana. He also enjoyed working with several of the marijuana team members. He said a silver lining was coming to light with this new assignment as he was learning new things. He said this was an opportunity for him to learn the narcotic side of law enforcement and diversify himself. He thought his transfer started to make sense. Cahill said he should not have internalized the transfer as much as he did because he thought that he had fucked up. I asked Agent Cahill about his relationship with his wife. He said they are not legally married, but they have been together off and on for a long time. He said they have had a back and forth relationship. She does not like him being both in the Army and CBI. Cahill said staying in the Army was for the extended health care the Army can provide. He also said he enjoys the friendships he has in the Army. He thought this relationship, he thought his relationship with his wife was good. He said with this recent injury, she is a nurse and she has been in full on nurse mode helping him. He said ever since he has known her, she has been a solid friend. The shooting on the 19th scared her, but she has been 150% supportive. So that's the end of the internal affairs report. Uh, and then the other part is transcripts from the preliminary hearing, which I suppose, and I haven't read all the way through it. I mean, all this stuff just came out, you know, less than an hour ago. Uh, so it was just a really quick read through of the documents and exhibits, but this is public information and it is on the, the courts, the, the website. Um, I'm not sure I have to compare and see if it's a new case number since the, uh, change of venue to Fremont County, but, uh, I do know that it's in a, a new place on, on the courts website. Um, so anyhow, there you go. Um, keep up the good work, Kit. Bye.